Chopin is probably one of the best known composers for the piano. Unfortunately, there are quite a number of works that are good introductions to his music. So today, let's have a look at his waltz in A minor. Are you sitting comfortably? Then let's begin. Hi, this is Tommy with Tommy's Piano Corner, the place for returning pianists or indeed anybody who loves piano to share tips and ideas of how to get the best from this great hobby. If it's your first trip here, then please do think about subscribing. Simply hit the little icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen now and it's all done for you. Chopin has a number of beautiful waltzes that great pianists regularly use in recitals and also as encore pieces. Perhaps his waltz in A minor is maybe the simplest of them all, and if you're looking to learn a Chopin waltz, then this is a great place to start. I first found it in issue 89 of Pianist magazine, and have to admit I very much enjoyed learning it. As its title suggests, the waltz is in A minor, so no sharps or flats. It's quite short at only 56 bars, plus of course a couple of repeated sections. Being a waltz, it's three quarter notes to the bar, so three, four time. Let's first look at the first 16 bars. This section is basically split into two halves, with the second eight bars starting the same as the first bars, however, the second half of the phrase is changed. Chopin uses a very similar structure to this in his C-sharp minor waltz too, where he'll start by repeating a section, but then changing the ending. Perhaps the first difficulty with this piece is the jumps in the left hand. This pattern of course is very common in waltzes by any composer. A bass note followed by two chords. In general the bass note will be an octave or more below the chord and so landing both the bass and the chords is important. I'd spend some time practicing just the left hand. If you aren't too confident with the jumps then I practice each direction separately. First, practice jumping from the bass note to the chord only. I repeat each measure several times before moving on to the next. Next, practice mainly jumping from the chord to the bass note. Again, repeat each several times before moving on to the next. Only once you're comfortable with doing each direction separately, would I start to put them both together. I noticed a while ago from my recording of playing actually a different waltz, but especially before a jump, I had a tendency to miss the second chord or only play part of it. Now let's take a look at the right hand. As you'd expect with Chopin, there are some ornaments within the piece. The first ornament we have is written as two small notes before the main note. I've tried to find the official name for this, but without success. If you know it, please put it in the comments for me. Anyway, what you see is what you get. We have a principal note with two shorter notes placed immediately before it. And in terms of the notes, it has the same pattern as a mordant. Yet here, of course, Chopin hasn't chosen to write it as a mordant, so he's notated it differently. I've interpreted this to mean that we play the small notes before the beat, so that the principal note will be played on the beat, unlike a mordant, which is generally played on the beat itself. I mean, I have read that all ornaments should always be played on the beat, yeah, then why would Chopin write out the two differently here? I'm sure many will disagree, and in honesty, I recommend you play as you think it sounds best. So first, I practice just bar four on its own. Then put bars three and four together. Then practice separately just bars three and four together. Pay particular attention to where the bass note and the right hand note 
coincide. Only then, once you're really comfortable with these two bars, would I then start practicing the entire first 16 bars. Now let's move on to the next section, bars 17 to 24. This is somewhat trickier than the first section in that there are additional ornaments and overall more movement in the melody line. To practice this little section, I would first practice each individual ornament in the right hand. Then for the left hand, we can use the same practice strategy we used before, practicing each jump in each direction. However, now when putting these together, I first use what I call my 4 4 waltz technique. So let's look first just at the left hand. There are basically three 4 4 variants that we can use. Now let's add the right hand. You can always watch this video for further details of how this technique works and how it can help with waltzes. Next we have the E major arpeggio, notated as triplet eighth notes and then quintuplet sixteenth notes. This might at first sound like a rhythmic nightmare, but in fact it isn't anything like as awkward as it might first appear. Practice the arpeggio itself in the right hand only, without worrying too much about the rhythm. If you've already done lots of arpeggio practice, then you should find this easy enough. If, however, you're a little rusty with this particular one, you might need to spend some time working octave by octave with it. Once you're okay with the notes, then add the left hand and play just up to the top B natural. Try to keep the three left hand beats nice and even and fit the right hand correctly into them. Work on it without adding the ornament at the end of bar 23 and 24 until you can reliably land the arpeggio alone. Now spend some time working on the ornaments. Here, pay particular attention to alignment. As our hands move up the keyboard, there is a tendency for our fingers to point further and further to the right unless we pay attention to the alignment of the wrist. Now practice these two bars alone until you're happy with them, before putting the whole arpeggio and ornaments together into one. I think bars 25 to 32 by now should present no problems. There is perhaps one different jump in bar 31 that you might want to practice independently, otherwise the remainder should now be easy enough. Now let's move to the next few bars. However, before looking at the right hand, let's again quickly consider the left hand. Bars 33 to 40 effectively move into A major, even though the key signature itself doesn't change. This means that the left hand now needs to negotiate a slightly different arrival chord, A major instead of A minor. We also have a different version of the E major chord that we need to use here. However, otherwise, this shouldn't present any problems given what we've already practiced. The right hand, however, is somewhat more tricky. Here, Chopin chooses to introduce a mordant in addition to the previous ornament. 
The mordant contains the same pattern of notes as in the earlier ornament. However, this time we play actually on the beats. So now we have two different ornament versions. First, the standard mordant, so played on the beats. And afterwards, that written as two little notes, so just before the beats. In addition, the right hand moves along with almost no pauses throughout these bars. The key thing here is to pick a good fingering. It took me a while to figure one out, but eventually I opted for this. To practice this, I'd recommend the same strategy of 4-4 I suggested earlier. First hand separately. then hands together. To finish off this piece, there are now only two small areas to isolate in bars 51 and 55. We have another mordant, which now starts on the second eighth note rather than perfectly on the beat, and a small trill. A trill, of course, is simply rapidly alternating between a pair of notes. The number of times you do this largely is up to the discretion and of course the skill of the performer. Trills though is yet another topic that can cause some debate. There are arguments as to where the trill should start above the principal note, or where it should start on the principal note. Often a trill is little more than a mordant with an extra note. Hence, it starts above the principal note. Other times, it's a much longer affair. My advice would be to try both and see which you prefer. If you can trill really quickly, then you might want to do a nice long trill here. If you're less proficient with your trills, then use a shortened version. Chopin is always intended to be played with rubato, which is borrowed time. Even when this is not expressly written in, so don't be afraid to add some ebb and flow into the music. However, do pay attention that you don't end up with something that sounds rushed in places or where it looks like there's a tricky ornament so that you slow down excessively. Similarly, don't be afraid to experiment with dynamics. Quite often they're not written in, so it's up to your discretion how you want to do it. Finally, let's consider the pedal. You should not be afraid to use pedal here. Depending on your edition, there may be pedal markings provided. In the score available from Pianist magazine, the pedal markings were given. However, mainly use your ear. However, one pedal change per bar is a good starting point that you can then refine later. I listened to lots of versions on Idagio and the interpretive choices for tempo, rubato, Dynamics and pedaling vary enormously, so don't be afraid to experiment. I hope you'll have as great a time learning this waltz as I did. My recommendation would be pretty much just to go through it from beginning to end, as I've sort of described in this video. The only thing I'd add really is that do pay attention to those technical difficulties. I mean, for example, take the ornaments. If you've played a lot of Mozart, Scarlatti or Bach in the past, then doubtless you'll breeze through these without really even thinking about them. But if you haven't, then do spend some extra time and extra attention on working on them carefully. Because of course, once you start playing them badly, trying to correct them later is extremely difficult to do. So if you're not already, then please do subscribe to Tommy's Piano Corner. Don't forget to click the little bell icon so you're notified of new videos as and when they're released. I thank you very much for watching and we'll see you very soon.